Get him another round of applause, please. What an amazing performance. <laughs> that was dope. And what an honor it is to be here with you all this afternoon as we have the extraordinary opportunity and honor to commemorate two things at the same time. We get to think about 55 years of infrastructure, 55 years of building, 55 years of community commitment and love for an urban league. And we also get to think about the life and the enduring legacy of the great Martin Luther King Jr. who was taken from us 54 years ago. Far, far, far too soon. And so today, what I'd like us to do at the time that we have, and I ain't gonna take up too much time, but the time that we have is to think about how we can continue to build on these great legacies. How do we continue to build on the legacy of an organization that has been committed to improving the lives of black and brown folk throughout the United States? How do we build on an organization that has recognized that for every black person there's a different way of being black? We share a community, we share a culture, we share a bond, we share a language, we share a tradition, but we never want to minimize or reduce us to our color. That's why we say if there's 55 black people in the room, there's 55 experiences, there's 55 shades of black. When we get them 55 people in the room, and we get some shades of white in the room, how do we come together to build what Dr. King was talking about? And that is the beloved community. How do we create a world where we don't turn on each other, but we turn to each other? How do we create the kind of community where people's needs are met? where people aren't being exploited, where we see people as ends rather than means, where we no longer have children who go to bed hungry every single night in the richest country in human history. How do we create a world where we no longer build more prisons than schools? How do we create a world where women are safe walking down the street? How do we create a world where anti-Semitism and Islamophobia no longer exist? How do we stop the pain? Well, there's no better example of that there's no better model for that in my humble estimation than the great Martin Luther King Jr. on April 3rd 1968 the day before Dr. King dies he gave a speech and it was a prophetic speech. He, he knew he didn't have much time left on this planet. Dr. King said something's going on in Memphis. He said, but if I could, he said, if, if the almighty God said to me, Martin Luther King, in what moment would you want to live? What would you pick? Dr. King, Dr. King took us on a tour of history, as only Dr. King could do. He, he said, he took us to Mount Olympus, he took us to Greece, and he said, I wouldn't stop there. He said, I'd want to see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assembled along the Parthenon, but I wouldn't stop there. He took us to Rome, and he talked about Roman civilization. He said it was a great moment to live in, but I wouldn't stop there. He took us to, 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 to the Church of Wittenberg, where his namesake Martin Luther had attached those 95 theses to the door of the church. He said, but I wouldn't stop there. He went to Abraham Lincoln, the vacillating president he described him as who was forced to sign an Emancipation Proclamation, he said, but I wouldn't stop there. He took us to Roosevelt, and then eventually he said, if I could choose, I would choose this moment 
right here in 1968. He said, now some would say that's a strange statement. The world is all messed up. He said, but only when it is darkest can we see the stars. Only when it is darkest can we see the stars. Dr. King was at his own personal darkest moment, confronting death every single day. The FBI that celebrates him now was on a mission to not just follow him and surveil him, but J. Edgar Hoover was writing letters to Dr. King telling him to kill himself. Years before he was killed, he'd been stabbed by a black person. Sometimes your skin folk ain't your kin folk. But Dr. King was also saying that the world that we lived in was dark. War, rumors of war, violence, racism, poverty, militarism, so much was happening. He said, but at this moment of darkness, that's when we have to ask the question that he wrote about prior, which was, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? So as we stand here, 55 years later, we have to ask ourselves the same question. Because the world is dark. We got chaos. We ain't got to go to Memphis. We ain't got to go to Birmingham. We can go to Battle Creek. And we can say that it is amazing success story that so many successful black folk are in this room. It's an amazing accomplishment that black and white people can be in this room and not only be civil and decent, but also be friends with one another. We can talk about wealth expansion and school access, but we still got so far to go. Our outcomes are still unequal. We are still working harder for less money. Women are still making 70 cents on the dollar. Black children who make, whose families have the same median in, uh, the same uh, income, annual income. When you control for class, we still get different outcomes in school. We still get different outcomes in the criminal justice system. We still get different outcomes on the job market. The world remains unequal, and the work that we do every single day, the work that you all do every single day, is the work of repairing the damage done. It is the work of shrinking the gap between the have-gots and the have-nots. That's what King was talking about, and he said, it is dark, but we can see the stars. It is dark now. It's so dark. We were driving in from Chicago. I was in Chicago yesterday. Kyra made me stop for fried chicken. <laughs> I didn't want to. I wanted some organic, <laughs> vegan options, but she made me stop at Harold's Chicken Shack. <laughs> and I felt so pressured that I ate some more this morning. <laughs> but as we were driving out of Chicago and you see what gentrification does and then we got out of Chicago and we hit the highway before I fell asleep <laughs> and I saw Benton Harbor where there's lead in the water And if you take a turn one way, you go to Flint, where there's been even more lead in the water. And you drive through, if you keep going, you'll hit Detroit, where our schools are being systematically dismantled, just like in Chicago where teachers are being forced to work even when there's a COVID scare. Not a COVID scare, COVID reality. And we arrived right here. So, against the backdrop of all of this, 
What does Dr. King's legacy have to teach us for the next 55 years? Well, a couple of things. For one, the legacy of King teaches us to engage in deep listening. Deep listening. Dr. King's tradition was one where we listen to people. Not just the people we agree with. Not just the people that's going to tell you you're right. Not just the people who share your experiences. Not just the people who look like you and believe like you. The whole idea of saying that there are 55 shades of black. The whole idea of saying that there are many, many ways of understanding it, race and class and gender is to say that we got to dig deep and understand everyone's experience. But too often when we operate in organizations and institutions, what we end up doing is privileging or centering the experiences of the people in charge. So we a bunch of middle class black folk who are doing all right, or a bunch of working class black folk who are doing all right. And when I say middle class, I ain't saying y'all rich. I know the month lasts longer than your money too, but sometimes there are people who are working poor, they work every single day and still can't meet their basic needs. And too often, they ain't got time to join an urban league. They can't be part of an NAACP. They can't show up to the thing, but it doesn't mean they don't want to be there, and it doesn't mean that their interests can't be represented. We must organize for them and with them. And if they can't be there, it doesn't mean we talk about them. It means we create the infrastructure so that they can be there. We don't sit there and complain that parent that nobody shows up to parent teaching night at 5 o'clock in the evening, knowing that most folks don't get off at 5 o'clock and many people have to work jobs that don't give them the luxury of leaving at 4 o'clock or, or not to take care of their kids because they can't get child care or a nanny. We move parent teacher night. We must listen to their voices. Too often, we try to organize for people, and we don't ask them what their needs are. We don't ask them what their interests are. We don't ask them what will make them whole. And so, King's tradition wasn't that. On January 15th, 1968, King wakes up, he gets dressed, he has, he has his phone on silent. <laughs> he throws on his jeans, a windbreaker jacket, he has breakfast with his family. That was good. And then he heads down to the church where he meets with sanitation workers. One had been mauled in Chicago and they were trying to figure out how to get safer working conditions and living wages and workers' rights. He listened to them. He met with Chicano activists trying to figure out how we could expand the freedom struggle. He was fascinated by what was happening at the border. He met with Negro preachers to figure out how they could build on the gains of 1964 and 1965. He listened to them. He met with anti-war activists, trying to figure out how to stop this thing in Vietnam. You see, Dr. King understood that we were better when we were not merely locked at the arm singer, we shall overcome, but also locked at the circumstance. That our collective predicaments it, when connected through deep listening, could create a united political front that could allow us to win. Let me say it differently. JFK walks through Harlem in 1960 holding up a black baby. It gets dismissed as a liberal campaign son, a cheap tricks, trying to make Adam Clayton Powell happy, trying to get some liberal votes. Like, like, uh, like, like, uh, like, like Bill Clinton walking through Arsenio Hall show playing the saxophone in 92, or Hillary Clinton in church in Selma in 08 trying to clap on beat. It was dismissed as a campaign stunt. Juxtapose that to Bobby Kennedy in West Virginia. He's in Appalachia holding up that white baby whose belly is bloated. Snot's coming out of his nose. He's crying. He's hungry. And we begin our war on poverty. He understood that the nation had a greater commitment 
to relieving white suffering than black suffering. He understood that America had a different misery index for one than the other. Now that wasn't Dr. King's final point. Dr. King had a moral vision that was so expansive that he knew that a baby in Boston and a baby in Birmingham and a baby in Botswana and a baby in Berlin were all worth the same and they all deserved our investment and our protection and our love. That wasn't his point. But Dr. King also understood that if we strategically work together and organize together and built together, we could have a more united and powerful front. That's what we got to think about today. Listen to each other so that we can hear the connections. You doing education reform and, and, and you doing anti-prison work and we say, well, I ain't got time to work with you or listen to what you're doing because I'm worried about what I'm doing. Where if we work together, we would understand the relationship between schools that are driving people directly into the prison and prisons that are allowing people to engage in recidivism to go back to prison because we know the one thing that stops you from going back to prison is education. And what's the thing they take out of the prison? Education. They understand the relationship, but we got to listen to each other so we understand the relationship. This is what it means to engage in listening. King wasn't just listening to be polite. He understood that a poor people's movement required listening to poor people. He understood the triplet of misery, racism, poverty, and militarism. He understood that you can't say that you fight in poverty and you fight in the war and not understand the relationship between poverty and war. Gil Scott Harris said everybody loved peace. Problem is you can't make no money off of it. As long as capital is being made, as long as capital is being accumulated, as long as there's multinational corporations with more powerful, with more power than governments, we're gonna have war. And who gets sent to war? Poor people, black and brown people, desperate people. And who are they sent to kill? Poor people, black and brown people, desperate people, exploited people around the globe. So if we are seriously, seriously considering listening, we engage in those types of analyses. Don't tell me you're worried about racism and you can't think about the environment. Where do you think they dump nuclear waste? Where do you think they put the power plants? Where do you, why do you think there's lead in your water? You think Gross Point, Michigan? is going to have 15,000 parts per billion of lead in the water? No, they reserve that for the D. They reserve that for poor black neighborhoods. They reserve that. You might get that in Battle Creek. You might get that in Benton Harbor, but you ain't going to get that at Gross Point. Why? Because we live in a country that assigns different value to different people's lives. And it's really that simple. So the legacy of King, I'm just trying to be mindful of time, the legacy of King is a deep, deep listening project. Our goal for this year and for the next 55 years is to engage in deep forms of listening. You see, Dr. King's legacy wasn't just getting us to listen to each other. It was getting us to organize with one another once we're done listening. I used to work at Fox News uh, on the visiting team. <laughs> and one of the most fascinating things that I found was that on the, when I would be on Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity or Fox and Friends, all them shows, By the third debate, I would have heard all the same talking points, all the same stats, all the same jokes. They were organized. They were meeting once a week to discuss strategy. And then everybody who was in that meeting then went out into the world, they went on the media, they went to the newspapers, they went on TV, they went to the radio to share those same talking points so everybody sounded on message and if you hear it enough it sounds like it makes sense even if it don't make no sense. 
because they listen to one another. But the point is, the people in that room didn't necessarily agree with each other. There were people in that room because they were Second Amendment advocates. They believed in guns, and they thought that anybody who had a gun, the right to bear arms, meant the right to have any gun at any time, of any size, anywhere, any place, any time. That's what they was in the room. Some were free market fundamentalists. They wanted to re re remove all restrictions from the market so that you could make as much money as possible. Some were against reproduct reproductive justice for women. Some were homeschooling advocates. Some didn't believe in dinosaurs. <laughs> Some loved war. They all had different positions. And some laughed at the others. Some thought one didn't make no sense. Some thought others were idiots. Some thought others were religious fanatics. Some thought others were too violent. But what did they do? They came together, they sat together, they listened together, they voted together, they spoke together, and they won. If people who don't even see the world the exact same way or so that who see it so vastly differently can come together, why can't we? Why can't we? You might not agree on my stance on energy. I might not agree on your stance on education. Now, I'm not saying we throw our ideological differences away, but what I'm saying is at times we got to organize, but sometimes we will be so together on 99% and we'll allow the 1% difference to throw each other away. We'll allow the slight ideological shift to cause me to leave the organization. We'll allow a difference of opinion to, st to create four organizations with five people in it instead of one organization with 20 people in it. And when that happens, our open enemies win. It doesn't matter if we got 55 years, if we spend the next 55 separate. It doesn't matter if we recognize 55 ways of being black, if we do it in 55 different places. We must come together. We must listen to each other. We must organize. But we must also force America to listen to itself. You see, Dr. King wasn't merely showing up for a march. I always emphasize to the students of history grown and young, to hold on to the real king. The real king organized in 63 a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. We call it the March on Washington now. They don't remind you what we were there for. We weren't, it wasn't like black folks said, let's go for a walk. It was a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. Why? Because we needed what? Jobs and freedom. The march was in 1963, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln freed us, but we were free but unequal. We were free to starve. We were free to be subjected to Jim and Jane Crow. We were free to black slave codes that became black codes. We were free to unequal schooling. We were free to all the things that democracy is not supposed to create and produce for us. So when he comes to the Lincoln Memorial, it's not a coincidence that he's standing in front of Lincoln, the emancipator, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation didn't work. That's why it's a march on Washington for jobs and freedom. King is signifying, like any good preacher's doing, he stands in front of Lincoln to say Lincoln didn't do it. He said, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand signed an Emancipation Proclamation. He said the Emancipation Proclamation is a promissory note. The Declaration of Independence is a promissory note. The Constitution is a promissory note. They like money, they like checks. He said, America wrote a check to the Negro. He said, the Negro stands on a vast island of poverty amidst an ocean of material wealth and prosperity. He said, the Negro's check, y'all can relate to this, the Negro's check has been returned insufficient funds. He said, I refuse to believe that the great vaults of democracy could be empty. 
King was telling America to listen to its own utterances, its own democratic promises. He was saying, America, you promised. We called the I Have a Dream speech, and it was a great speech. But before he gets to the dream, he talks about the broken promise. He's saying, America, you promised. 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, America, you promised. Emancipation Proclamation, America, you promised. Constitution, America, you promised. Declaration of Independence, you promised. 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, America, you promised. 1954, Brown v. Board, America, you promised. 1955, Brown v. Board, too, America, you promised. 1964, Public Accommodations, America, you promised. 1965, Civil Rights Act, Voting Act, America, you promised. King is demanding that America listen to itself so that it can finally live up to its promise. And that's the work that we must do right now. We must continue to demand that America live up to its promise. Equity in education. America, you promised. CARES Act. Clean Water Act. Climate Justice Bill. John Lewis Voting Bill. George Floyd, Justice of Policing, America, you promised. We ain't got to rebuild this thing. We're not starting from zero. We simply have to get to a place where we honor that promise and listen to that promise and hold true to that promise and live out that promise. And so family, as we think about the life of the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who gave his very body as a ransom for American democracy, let us finally commit to listening to each other. Let us listen to this nation's democratic promises. Let us listen to the voices of freedom. And let us begin by finally, truthfully, and consistently listening to the life and radical legacy of the great Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you. Family, we have time for questions and answers. We've got about 15 minutes, maybe, for questions and answers, something like that, 10, 15, 10. Um, so anybody who has questions, please. So that, the current talking points, and maybe you've heard it, is if we can't get people to vote with us, let's just not do anything. Let's not vote. And so as you have this conversation, and I have it a lot, and you're pressing against like that thought process, what do we say to combat the huge group now that has that ideology? It's a great question. Um, I think we first have to ask a philosophical question and a political question, strategic question around what voting is. And I think we have to demystify voting. We can't fetishize voting. Voting isn't magic. You can't vote your way to justice. You can't vote your way to freedom. Um, but you can vote your way out of some justice. You can vote your way out of some freedom. Because one thing that white supremacists do, one thing that homophobes and transphobes do, one thing that anti-Semites do, they vote. They vote every election, every not every four years, every six months, they vote in every election. So often, so when I, when I engage people, I, I, I begin from a place of saying, look, I agree, voting isn't mag a silver bullet. Voting's not magic. But voting is one tactic among many. It's like the sit-in strategy. You can't sit your way to freedom either. If we just sat on the Pettus Bridge and got beaten ahead every, every month, we wouldn't be any closer to freedom either. It's a, it's a multi-pronged strategy. And the problem with saying that we're not going to vote is that, um, is that it, one, it, it yields all that ground to people who do vote. 
So now, when even if there's a, a contested election, um, I'm thinking about people who vote only every four years, right? And there's a contested election like there was with Trump and Biden in the state. Who's the state secretary? Who's the secretary of state? Who's the one who's going to decide the fairness of the election? The person that was elected by people who voted. And in Georgia, that was Republicans, right? Trump still lost because the, the, the gap was too big. But my point is, what if that's a, a different kind of election, right? right? Um, for people who care about trans rights and can't get into a bath and, and, and want trans bathrooms or gender neutral bathrooms, excuse me, uh, that often happens. The decisions around that issue have been largely shaped by state level voting policies. Right? People say, well, people don't listen. Those same people often complain about the library being closed or the pothole not being filled. Even if you don't believe in presidential elections, which you should. Voting on the day-to-day -day level is what allows you to actually, ha for your ride not to get, the tires on your ride not to fall off because there's potholes everywhere. I mean, real functional day-to-day -day stuff, right? Um, we got friends who go to jail, and we complain about all white juries convicting them. But you can't be on the jury if you ain't registered to vote. So even if, your, even if your vision was a bunch of Negroes to get on a bunch of juries and let everybody off, you can't do that without the voting process. <laughs> right? So my, my point is, I begin the conversation by thinking with them strategically about how voting can work as a tactic. Now, their point is people ain't listening. Well, that's fine. The, organize around those people. If Senator Smith ain't listening, the answer is to not vote for Senator Smith and to, and to, sit, on your, and to sit in the House. Because if you sit in the House, Senator Jones is going to win. And Senator Jones is 10 times worse than Senator Smith. And don't pretend not to be racist. So, or, so, so for example, if we sit out the last election, and you believe that Trump is bad, and Biden is bad but better than Trump, I'm just saying if that's someone's belief, you don't have to believe that. There's lots of perspectives on this. But if you think Biden is, is, is mediocre but Trump is trash as a candidate, and you say, well, you know what, they both trash, I'm going to sit, you're effectively saying, I'm going to allow Trump to win. Now, for some of us, that becomes an ideological experiment. That becomes a kind of ideological practice. But for the person who's dying of COVID because they can't get relief, for the, per per for the small business that gets closed because they can't get a PPP loan but Shake Shack could, that is no longer just ideological, academic exercises. That's real life. You feel me? Y'all with me? So um, I, when I sit with people and build with them, my thing is, so if you don't like Senator Smith, organize to beat Senator Smith with somebody who's better than Senator Smith. Not say your hands and let your open enemies pick the person who's going to represent you. So for me, it's a, it's a tactical question. And I think we're at our best when we take it up as one. But the problem is we come out of a tradition that has valorized voting so much that it often gets presented as the sign of our democracy and the sign of our democratic strength and the, and the reflection of our, of, our, of our freedom. So it's like, I vote because my ancestors voted. Our ancestors, our ancestors died for the vote. No, our ancestors didn't die for us to vote. Our ancestors died for us to be free. And they believed that voting was a key exercise of freedom and part of the pathway to get more free. So to follow that tradition, yeah, we can vote to honor them, but we also have to do other work. And, 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 and so rather than making it either or, I try to engage them as a both and kind of thing. Yeah. Otras preguntas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. Enjoyed your uh, remarks. I did want to um, go back to the conversation about those who have those uh, philosophical differences mm. and how to, um, right here in your local uh, existence and your, your, your local work, um, how do you see making that divide uh, come together a little bit more? Um, 
in, in a way that's meaningful, that, that we're all synchronized yeah. and working towards the same same goals to help our community. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, 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 don't, I don't want to oversimplify or uh, be reductive about what these differences mean, right? Because some differences are significant. If I believe in abolishing prison, which I do, I'm an abolitionist, and someone else believes that we need to get more cops on the street to lock people up to stop crime, that is a huge divide. Now, we may both agree that there's crime happening and that harm is being committed in our streets, burglaries, robberies, shootings. We, we agree on that, but we're so divided on the solution that it might be hard for us to have any kind of meaningful consensus on a project. I understand that, so I don't want to oversimplify this. Some differences are huge, right? If I want to provide refuge for refugees and you believe that they are foreign enemies who shouldn't be in the country, you know what I mean? Like, some things we can't, we can't compromise on. I tell people that in relationships, she want two kids, I don't want no kids, we'll compromise and have one kid. You ain't, if you don't want kids, you get one, you didn't compromise, you lost. <laughs> right? You lost. Um, so, I've seen so many brothers fall for that compromise. And sisters too, I'm sure. I just, just my homies, that happens to them all the time. I said, I wouldn't have it none. She wanted four. We got two. <laughs> all right. So, where was I? Yes. So, some things aren't, you can't compromise on. And so part of how I think about organizing work is one, to organize with people who do have a similar organizing vision as me, a similar political orientation. Again, we ain't gonna see the world the exact same way, but we need to be in the same neighborhood, right? We may not sing the same notes, we need to be in the same key, right? But to the extent that we're not, I think it's also helpful to say what are the actions, what are the organizing moves, what are the events, what are the tactics that we can take on that don't compromise either of our position? So if, if, if I'm the abolitionist and he's the lock them all up thing as a solution to violence, we can still do things to get guns off the street. We can still organize our, we both want guns off the street. And we both want young people not to shoot each other. So we both can do violence interruption. We can both go to the street and talk to brothers and sisters about making different choices. There's at least three or four things we can do at that level to address this issue at the same time that there are some fundamental structural and systemic things that we see differently. And so, I think too often we focus only on the differences and we wash our hands of things and then assume there's nothing we can do to, um, to, to work together. I have to believe we both love black folk. I have to believe we both want black folk to stop going to jail. I have to believe we want black folk to live in better schools or they will go to better schools and live in better neighborhoods and to get paid the same as everybody else, right? So if we begin from that place, I know there's something we can come together on. I know it. But we have to be willing to not become so purist in our politics that we won't organize or build or work or strategize with anybody who doesn't see the world exactly as we do. And I think that's, that's key, particularly in, in, in mainstream organizations like the Urban League, right? Because in many ways, there's going to be a, a fairly liberal to progressive political agenda at, at play. And there's going to be some folk who come in who lean more conservative. And there's going to be folk who lean more radical. And in those spaces that I've had this experience, you know, I'm like, all right, y'all, I, I, get, I get why you want Officer Friendly to be doing the cha-cha slide with the kids in the neighborhood. But I get, I, that's good for the gram, but like, that's not actually solving this issue of police militarism. What do we do about it? You know. And sometimes they be like, hey, bro, shut up. Bro. You go somewhere, go, go to another organization. This is what we do here. And sometimes you have to be able to say, look, th that's what they do here. I I I'm gonna appreciate y'all from somewhere else. I'm gonna go do my thing over there and when we can collaborate, we can. That's, it's okay to say that too. It's okay to say, I don't share this vision. Um, but there's a difference between walking away because you don't share a, f the f a fundamental worldview. There's some huge fundamental worldview differences in walking away because um, I believe in abolition and you believe in defunding the police. 
And we want to both of us want to reduce police budgets. Both of us want to stop police militarizing our streets. Both of us want alternatives to incarceration. We on the same team, right? And so even though we may disagree on what to call it or how to name it, that becomes theoretical and abstract so much so that by that logic, we'd basically only be an organization of people who believe the exact same thing we did, and we would have no organizations. So we have to we, we have to learn what the difference is between ideological differences in tensions and fundamental worldview differences. And I think that's key. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Michelle. Uh, Dr. Mark, thank you so much for being here and coming all the way to Battle Creek um, to speak to us. I see a lot of people from the community here who are involved in like local nonprofits and um, talk a lot about um, in creating change here yeah. and paving the way for us, um, people of color. So thank you so much um, for this inspirational speech. Um, do you ever feel or do you ever experience um, a young person or actually anybody of any age um, who doesn't identify man, who doesn't identify white, that says um, that they might not have the self-esteem um, high enough or the courage uh, to push against the grain or to tell their leaders or their bosses that hey, what you're doing is harming me and I have different ideas than you and I think that you should hear me. Um, and if so, what do you tell them? Yeah. Or, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great, great question. By the way, is there any more of those waters running around here? I'm putting the, I got into that age where I get tired and thirsty quick. Oh, thank you. Is that for my cue? <laughs> I appreciate it, my brother. Oh, man. Stay good for something. The, thank you, brother. The, um, it's a great question. Um, and the answer is yes, all the time. Speaking truth to power is challenging. And getting people to organize or to be emboldened or encouraged to speak back against an unjust system is challenging enough. But getting people to self-advocate, getting people to say that to their boss or their teacher or their parent or their friend or their, or, or you know, in a more sort of micro level interaction is even more challenging. Um, I think the first thing, I think about, have you ever read this book, Heavy? by Kiese Lehman. It's a wonderful book. I strongly suggest, um, strongly suggest reading it, if you haven't. It's one of the great memoirs. It came out maybe five, four, four years ago, and it's one of the great memoirs I've ever read. Um, and one of the things he talks about is deserve it, being deserving of good love, healthy choices, and second chances good love, healthy choices, and second chances. And I always think about that, both at the personal level and at the structural level. Good love, healthy choices, and second chances. And so when we advocate, particularly, like you said, people who are non-white, non people who are non-woman identifying, um, in a world that tells people, or non-male identifying maybe, um, when you tell people who are who have historically been rendered marginal. The entire world has told women that they're worth less than men. The entire world has told people who are not white that they're worth less. And so it becomes very easy to normalize and accept inferior treatment, problematic treatment, troublesome treatment, both at the structural level and at the interpersonal level. That means we're, we learn to accept, you know, poor people go to poor schools. Right? We learn to accept that, you know, black neighborhoods are going to have more crime and more policing. Um, and so part of the work of doing, of addressing what you're talking about is I talk to people both again at the level of advocating for themselves and advocating for broader justice, is to, is to remind them that, that they deserve something different, that they deserve quote unquote good love. 
All right, good love at the level, at the public level means justice, right? As people say, justice is what love looks like in public. And so there's a way that we have to tell people against the backdrop of patriarchy, sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, etc., xenophobia, that, they, that people deserve something else. So the first level of advocacy that I do or engagement is to encourage, is to encourage them to believe that they deserve something better that they deserve to be treated in a way, because oftentimes people will accept poor treatment because they've been taught through our culture, through our media, through our interactions, through our parenting, through whatever, that they actually deserve it. And so letting them know that they actually deserve something different structurally and interpersonally is key. Um, and then healthy choices. We all deserve healthy choices, but we all, oftentimes we make unhealthy choices when we don't realize that we deserve healthy ones. Whether it's food security, where you grow up in a neighborhood where you think that you can have um, um, where, where, where you don't realize that access to fresh fruit and vegetables is not just a privilege, but it's a, ne it's a necessary right. I mean, these are things that we deserve. But if you don't believe that you deserve healthy choices, then when you make the unhealthy choice, when you go to, to Harold's every day, you don't believe that you deserve a healthy choice. You don't consider the healthy choice. You don't believe that you deserve a work environment or a classroom environment or a family environment or a relationship where you're treated as with dignity and, and justice and, 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 and humanely, where you are treated with love and respect. You believe that you don't deserve that stuff. And if you believe you don't deserve that stuff, um, then you will continue to engage. I'm not blaming the victim. I'm saying that quite the opposite. I'm saying that we have become ideologically trained to believe that we deserve less. And part of, part of the process of liberation is realizing that we all deserve good love and healthy choices, even if we fall short, even if we make a mistake, even if we commit a crime, even if we do an act of harm, we all deserve second chances. And if we lay those three things out, I think people feel more encouraged through our mentoring, our teaching, our organizing, our political education to, um, to push back. Yeah. I think we got time for one more question, two more questions. We got to see one here and then I'll give you the last word. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hill, I'll make mine quick. Um, first, thanks for your powerful words. And I want to give you some good news. You get an extra punch on your black card if you got the hot sauce at Harold's and got the number two. Oh, I did. Okay. I That's did. I want you to know that. But no, my question, real seriously, I want to go back to the voting um, thing that the young lady brought up with the first question. In our household, one of the things that um, I think really has us, uh, that's been on our mind, my wife and I, is that it feels like the voters' rights have kind of been pushed back. We thought after all the drama that we went through, through the election and just the January 6th thing and all that, that that would be a priority for the administration to deal with voters' rights and trying to get some kind of bill passed. And just wanted to hear your thoughts on that, sir. About which part? The, the voting? The voters' rights. Just trying to get some kind of uh, bill passed for yeah. voters' rights with all the things that are happening as you see these states passing these laws and trying to make it tougher for people yeah, to vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting question. Um, there's a way. It's interesting also in, in the, at a moment where everybody is honoring Dr. King and John Lewis to be at the same time fighting to undo their legacies with regard to voting. There's a narrative that we must um, protect the vote from fraud, right? This is the argument for, for voter ID laws, this is the, vote, the argument for, um, for doing away with measures that have made voting more accessible, whether it's absentee balloting, balloting whether it's write-in stuff, what we saw during COVID, et cetera. And this is what we call a solution in search of a problem. There's no voter fraud. The number of voting fraud incidents are infinitesimal. That's a good word for you high school kids. It's infinitesimal. You got a better chance. Voting fraud is so, I don't even know what to compare it to. The Pistons got a better chance of winning the championship. <laughs> Wrong statement, sorry, my bad. Um, but no, you, you, 
they are literally trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. And what they're doing is they're creating more laws that effectively make it harder for the most vulnerable populations to win or to vote, which makes it easier for the people fighting to win. These measures are often only passed in states where there are a lot of large numbers of black voters, poor voters, elderly voters, etc. Right? Um, the idea that I need an ID card to vote um, could sound logical on its face if we understood what's at stake. My well, my mother, I'll use my my father passed away this last year, so. But, but that, he's still a good example. My father passed away last year, uh, actually, yeah, a year ago. And he was born in 1929 in Wilkes County, Georgia. Wilkes County, in Washington, Georgia is a city. Wilkes is the, the bigger township. Wilkes County had like 2,000 people in it, just to give you an idea what big means in that part of Georgia. My mother's in Farmville, Virginia. So my father couldn't vote in the South until he was 30, 30, this is the math question, 37, maybe 38, depending on when the, when the election was. To get his birth certificate, or for his mother to get a birth certificate, would have required us to move, go back down to Georgia, get to a courthouse. Back then, somebody just signed a paper. Once, somebody came through town once a month and asked when you were Born. They filled out some paperwork, they gave it to you, right? So your birth date is largely a rumor anyway in this part of town. It would have cost money to get the information necessary to get the ID necessary to vote. So effectively, we would have been paying to vote. We have a constitutional amendment designed to avoid what? Poll taxes. Because they, it was unconstitutional to have to pay to vote because it disenfranchised who? Poor people. So if we install voting laws that require the poor, the people from the most rural parts and the poorest parts, and these are the oldest people, to have to do stuff and spend money to vote, then we've effectively reinstituted a poll tax. Now, that might be a necessary thing. If there were just a whole bunch of people running around trying to vote when they shouldn't. I mean, it's one of them things that's like an urban legend. I, I, I know a lot of black people. I ain't met a black person yet that's been running around trying to sneak and vote twice. <laughs> Biggest problem in my house, and this sister just said the same thing, right? It's trying to get black people to vote once. <laughs> I just ain't never met nobody. Yo, man, I voted twice this week, yo. I, I ain't met one yet. And so, <laughs> But it's not coincidental that the states where this is happening are the states that are vulnerable to turns in the election outcome based on the number of poor people that vote, the number of black people that vote, the number of students that vote, the number of elderly people that vote, the number of, and in some cities and states now, the number of DACA folk who vote. So there is um, an incredibly transparent logic to this strategy. I think where I get most frustrated is that we continue to vote for people who say they're going to go one way, and then when they're in office, they either vote the other or they sit and do nothing to resist those who are actively operating against our interests. And so you're absolutely right. What we're seeing right now in the, in the Congress, right at this very moment, and what we've seen for the last seven days, um, is emblematic of what we're talking about, right? Which is that Republicans will continue to push back against any bill that expands voting rights. And Democrats haven't met a fight that they're unwilling, you know what I mean, to be feckless about. And, and, and uncourageous, it's actually quite stunning. I see more bold Twitter statements than I do actual actions in terms of how people vote or how people organize in the Congress, particularly in the Senate right now. Yeah. Okay. And it's, act it's actually an expansion of what you were just saying about the filibuster and really about what you were saying earlier about, you know, voting. 
at the local level and how it trickles all the way up. Just a short answer. Do you think a lot of this progress could be made for us through term limits in Congress? It's a great question. I mean, there's an argument for it that people become comfortable. I think a more active citizenry and voting base is more important than term limits. Um, there's a, there's, there is value. I, I see both sides of the, of the term limits question, right? There's a way that people who are just career senators and career Congress people um, are uh, maybe less invested in responding to the needs of the voters. But there's also an argument that if you're only going to be there for 12 years as a senator, 18 years as a senator, 10 years as a, as a, as a representative, that you, you could even be, if it's not a permanent job, you could be even more beholden to outside interests. Right? Like, I'm only going to be here for, for two terms, y'all, so I'm, I'm up for the taking because as soon as this thing is done, I got to get a real job. Right? So there's, there's that argument, too. There's also something to be said about experience and power. I, I, having John Lewis in the Congress for decades mattered. You, you know what I mean? Like, that, that, that mattered. Having Conyers in the Congress mattered. You know? And, and so I, I struggle with that versus having the career politicians who, I mean, who do nothing to advance our interests. So for me, what I try to do, rather than think about term limits, is think about what it would mean for everybody who's a veteran member of Congress to have legitimate pressure placed on them in every election, right? Because it's, it's, if in every election you had to actually show your work, <laughs> then maybe they'd be fighting for us all the time. But because they know I'm in a safe district and I don't have to do anything for the next 12 years, they don't have to think about anything. Yeah, so that, that's more how I think about it, yeah. Okay, um, so my question is around organizing. Uh, what you said earlier today, uh, working at Fox and noticing the different folks who have differences in perspectives, but at the end of the day had the same messaging. And one of the things I notice about our community, and I'm sure communities all over, particularly black folks, is that we do, t because we're relational, and we had a panel discussion about being um, more relational based versus transactional based, but we tend to organize around like, right? Like, I can work with you if I like you, and I can't work with you if I can't. And I see this as a barrier to us building common vision and organizing. And I'm wondering if you notice that dynamic from where you sit, and what advice do you have for us to navigate around um, how we organize differently? Yeah, um, first of all, I think the organizing question is the key one, right? Because we only get what we organize for. It's that simple. We're only going to get what we organize for. Um, you raised such a powerful question. The question of like shouldn't matter. I mean, do I like to like the people I work with? Of course. All right? Do I like to be able to build with people and develop deeper bonds with people? Absolutely. But the solidarity that I build and the love that I build is born out of the work, not out of the interpersonal appreciation for one person or another. Although that often happens when we build them for the same cause. But as I've been organizing for a long time, since I was a teenager, and there are people who I've been organizing with that long who get on my daggone nerves. And I still have to build and work with them. I think part of what we have to do to get beyond the interpersonal beef is to train for leadership differently. Right? We have to actually train people to understand that organizing work isn't, it's not, a, it's not social, right? Because it's, it's a, it, there's a sociality to it because we're working together, but the goal is to get free. And so we have to prioritize is this person going to help us get free? Is this person going to do the work that will advance our mission and our cause? That has to be the primary question. But we have to teach that. And we don't teach that. And so we organize our organization. Say, well, we organize the fraternities and sororities. Say, well, we organize the church choir. Sometimes we try to pick the most qualified people. We often pick the most popular people and the people who get the most this or the most that or the people who people like the most, as opposed to the thing that might get the person with the, who has the most qualification to meet the goals. We have to unlearn that. But that's not a generational challenge, that's a human challenge, right? You go to any black neighborhood in America, you're gonna find Second Baptist Church. Third Baptist, it, it, it was just one. Somebody didn't get the part in the choir, somebody said somebody, Greens was nasty, next thing you know, Second Baptist, right? The, the, 
we, we all got to unlearn this stuff. All right. Back to King and them was fighting too. The Panthers got into fist fights and shootings and stabbings and everything else. So did the SNCC and SCLC. So this ain't new. Dr. King got kicked out of the Baptist Convention. They said he was too vain. He was trying to be all in the videos, you know. Like, they, so this isn't new. Malcolm X, same thing. The men, many of the ministers in the nation didn't like Malcolm because they said Malcolm was getting too much attention. And he thought too much of himself. This is, this is our history. So to that extent, this isn't a new challenge. But we, what we can hope is that we unlearn the worst habits of the past and bring in the best parts of that beautiful tradition and move forward. That's what political education is. Thank you all. I appreciate you. God bless you. Come on, let's give another round of applause for Dr. Hill. Thank you so much for those words. At this time, we would like to welcome you to have lunch with us. If you go to the right um, and cut through the vendors, lunch is prepared. Um, you have two options, either meatballs or baked chicken. Um, we'll also like to invite you to um, support our vendors. Um, please spread the word. They'll be here until 8 o'clock tonight. We also have a free vaccine clinic. And finally, two announcements. Um, 6 o'clock, we have the African Drumming and Dancing, and our indigenous community will be also be here 6 o'clock p.m. tonight. On February the 11th, um, at 6.30 in the evening, Southwestern Michigan Urban League will hold, be hosting our annual um, Martin Luther King um, dinner. And so if you would like more information, please contact one of us. Also during that week, 12 noon via Facebook Live and Zoom, we'll be hosting our community engagement series. So please, if you have any questions, let us know. Otherwise, please um, support our vendors just over um, um, the drape here and help yourself to some lunch. It's a $10 fee for the lunch. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon. All right, well, oh, good evening, everybody, for the ones that are here. Um, it ain't going to be proper for me to speak in, in our native tongue, our native language. We couldn't speak this language until about uh, 1978. The Native American Indian Religious Movement was uh, signed and uh, just representing our rights, you know, we, we be who we are, what we have to, what we need to. So, uh, bonjour, Jaya. We want to bonjour, Jaya. Say hello to all you. Uh, we want to bonjour, Jaya. We want to bonjour. We didn't talk about everybody, all my relations, everything. All wash on Gizha, Gizha, Kaz, Shikega, Dolem, the God is the Ebibus, Dosh Bia. Why not? She was a witch. She was a witch. She was a witch. She was a witch. And uh, all I said was the spirit and who I was. And I'm not getting this up. Uh, Kevin Harris is my English name. I'm a culture specialist in Mississippi. Here I'm in Potawatomi, tribal Indian government system out there in Athens. And uh, we came here to, to spread the love. And uh, you know, that's one of our grandfather teachings, seven grandfather teachings. You know, to know love is to know peace. And that's one thing as being human beings, we're told to not love and also told to love, but the man objective is to love, and that's no peace, inner peace, and that's energy, big energy, and that's what we're big on. So uh, we're gonna sing these songs for our drums, this old way, and all um, these hand drums, it's gifted to us from, you know, some of those Creek teachings. And we're both dead one, and we're part of water, and fire keepers, and uh, from this local tribe here. So uh, we all ever, we all got things in common, and that's for that sound like that. That hurt me, hear that hurt me out of all our songs. You know, drums even today in modern music, you know, that bass, you know, a bass, that's that hurt me. You know, it's always spiritual. Music is spiritual. So uh, that's what I'm kind of sharing that good way. So uh, I want to introduce um, another member of the tribe here. 
Bonjour. My name is Greece Mendoza. We're here to represent racial healing. We're here to represent that diversity, right? We're here to honor Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and everything that he's worked for. He's worked for everybody, and not just our people, not just the black people, but he was really putting in that effort and for that work. He had a dream for it didn't matter if you were yellow, purple, striped. It didn't matter if you came from a, if you even felt like you came from a different planet. It didn't matter. He was really pushing for equality. That you can walk these very streets right here and feel safe about who you are. So we brought these drums here today. We're gonna sing this welcome song today. And when we sing this song, we're petitioning to the spirits up above to come down and help our people. And who do we mean when we say our people? You know, it don't have to be just red-skinned people. It don't have to be just black-skinned people. But we're talking about the four colors race of man. We're talking about that wawiyayachmo wind. So in Potawatomi, that's talking about that four ways of talking because we come all the way around the earth and our black people since the beginning of time have walked across the whole entire planet earth and they have seen and interacted and have greeted with every single nation on this planet and that's the white nation that's the red nation the brown nation the black nation every single color race and man that's why we're even we're balanced nobody's better than nobody and that's what this welcome song is about it's about bringing that we remember what our doctor was teaching us before he died. We recite over and over again his speeches every single time in our classrooms. We make sure that these public schools don't forget what Martin Luther King did for our people. What he did so that we can do these things freely. For me, being a black-skinned young man, I'm representing on both sides of the field. I'm representing for our black people, I represent for our Anishinaabe people. My mom's a Native American, my dad's black, so I got a lot to hang on to. I got a lot to remember. It's nothing to play around about when we're thinking about racial healing, when we're thinking about coming together, because a lot of people never met somebody who can come from both sides like that. Because I know when I was growing up in the 90s, I was growing up on the west side of Grand Rapids, and I went to Indian school, and there wasn't no black people around a lot of my Anishinaabe people that I was around. I was the darkest one in my family. And I know a lot of my uncles had it hard for me when I was growing up, because they were full-blooded Anishinaabe. They didn't really, they didn't know how to interact with their black nephew. You know what I mean? It was hard for them. And then when I got older, I started coming around my father's side. When I turned about 10 years old, I came to Battle Creek, Start meeting my family on the north side here. Start interacting with my cousins. Start understanding the behavior patterns of the, of the black community. Start understanding the teasing. They pushed me on the ground, punched me in the face. And I had to learn that type of love. There's a different love. It's a black love. You know, it's different. It's different. It really is. So I had to grow up and understand both. But I'm here because I represent everybody. Because every time I get on stage, there's somebody that says, you know what, Therese? I'm half Portuguese and half black. So I know what you meant. You know, I'm half Greek and half black. I know what you mean, Therese. I come from this Italian neighborhood in Chicago, but my dad is black. I know what you mean, Therese. You know? My family over here speak Italian. They speak Spanish over here, but then my mama black. So I know what you mean. That's where I come from. I come from the Anishinaabe. I come from here on Potawatomi. So, you know, they didn't really know how to say old way about the mean when they came to this country. Those colonizers is what I'm talking about. They didn't know how to say that. So they pronounced this as Potawatomi. So, uh, you know, I get real long-winded because I'm really into uh, history and into, I do this, I travel everywhere. I go to all the schools. I travel all up and down the Great Lakes region. I go to all the powwows, different ceremonies. And so I get invited out to embrace this type of love and this type of interaction. I talk a lot about diversity. And I can get real heavy in speaking Potawatomi too, but I won't do that today. <laughs> you know? 
So uh, today, you know, we're going to sing a, a welcome song, and I'm going to turn this mic down because we don't need it when we sing this song. And remember, this song is for us, and we got to remember that we got these cameras here, and that this event is being live. It's being live streamed because there's going to be people at home, and then there's going to be people that can go on the internet and look up this. So the people that's coming on after us, too, we got to understand we're making history, just like our doctor did. Before he died, you know, we're conducting that same spiritual change, you know, we're, we're conducting change, we're asking for change, and we're keeping our cultural diversity alive, because this is what they try to strip away from us, you know, this is what they try to take, and those African drums right there, that's what they try to take away back in the day, wasn't allowed to use it, wasn't allowed to do it, it's against the law in this country. So we got a lot to be thankful for and be honored that we're doing this in a good way. Kachim and Gwich, everybody. Oh, Gwich. So this, uh, this welcome song right here was taught to me by an elder who passed away about uh, seven years ago, six years ago. Let me see right here. And uh, he, he learned this song from the 60s. So it's an old style song. We're gonna sing it four times through, representing the four directions of life. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Which? <clears throat>
everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know about y'all, but I was lost in that. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Awesome. Can we give them another hand? That was great. Very good performance. Thank you, Sherry. At this time, let's receive from Flint, Michigan, the Cougar African Dancing and Drumming Troop. Let's receive them. Give them a hand. First day, I'd like to say Jumbo. Everybody say she Jumbo. She Jumbo. We sang the whole is why we are glad to be here today. It's our pleasure to be here to perform for you. Dealing with the drum and the dance, we're here. We made it. If you didn't know something about the drummer with the culture and the history, the drummer used to get his hands cut off. Oh. Because he would tell the story. So we are gurus. So it's my pleasure to be here to be able to play this drum, especially for Dr. King on this special day. Because let's just say uh, maybe 50 years ago, 60 years ago, this wasn't allowed. 
don't care where you went. It was just not allowed nowhere. And the reason why, because we told a story. We carry traditions, and it's allowed to go with it. When you say kungana, kungana means to be connected or connect things together. Um, we're a West African drum and dance group, and uh, we're glad to be here to perform for you. Okay? So we hope you enjoy it.
Now, anybody been to Ghana? Nobody's been to Ghana? You must go to Ghana. In Ghana, there are drums. Uh, let me see. We would have to stand on this building in order to play those drums. Really? That's how large they are. You can look them up. They are Shante drums. We're going to appear a piece called Gota. Gota is from the skin that goes on the drum, what it represents. Okay, this is Gota.